talking about Moses' day. <laughs> yeah, for real. I didn't know Moses was a pirate. The thing is, Moses is not a the scriptures on Noah today. It'd be a little. You'd <laughs> be, be playing the part of Moses. More fully, what are you? I know your wife's obsession with uh, what's his name, the Caribbean the pirate. Oh, Johnny Depp. Yeah. No, she's not a Johnny Depp person. Nope, nope. All right. Good morning, everybody. So let me let me start so I can just tell everybody the story and get it over with. So I was working in the backyard yesterday and I was using a jigsaw overhead, cutting a soffit, got debris in my eye, tried to flush it out for about two hours, couldn't get it out. So went to the ER. They uh, gave me some numbing drops and some antibiotic for ointment for the eye and said, go see your eye doctor on Monday. Gee, thanks. So don't read, don't watch TV, don't do anything. I'm like, well, that's awful boring. So I'm here before you this morning teaching like normal. So that's what's going on. So I hope you all had a, a good week. Had a little scare this morning when I went to open up. I was so excited about this lesson that I actually had it ready last Monday, getting ready for today, and I didn't open it open it up since. So I get here this morning and turn on the computer and can't find it. I'm like, oh. well, then I had to log into my computer at home remotely, and then was able to bring it in. So we've got a lesson this morning. So that's pretty good. Excited about that. So for all of you joining us online and after the fact. That's what's going on. So we are still talking about Moses. And remember, this is different than just a, a study of the book of Exodus, which we've kind of done before. So we're not focusing on the events of the Exodus. We're focusing on who Moses was, what are the events that led him to that point in his life to be used by God? What are the problems that he had, what are the character flaws that he had, and how God used those things to really alter the course of history. So last week, uh, we were talking about the conditions of the Hebrew people. Now remember, that's different than what we used to call them. Prior to this point, we called them Israelites. So what's the difference between an Israelite and a Hebrew? Does anybody remember? Anybody know? I just know that Hebrew means slave. That's it. So at this point, the Israelites were not their own nation anymore. They were now enslaved by the Egyptians. And so the Egyptians called them slaves. And the Egyptian word for slave is Hebrew. So that's where that word came from. So throughout the whole lesson, Suzanne yesterday kept on telling me, call them Israelites, call them Israelites, but the language is still Hebrew today. So even though, yes, they are Israelites, their language is still Hebrew. So where we left off last week was a new Pharaoh. Pharaoh had no idea what Joseph the Israelite did and the permissions that the Hebrews or that the, the Egyptians gave the Israelites to stay there in Egypt. And so now we've got a people that are over a million strong. The new leadership is like, you know, they can take us over just if they wanted to. So we need to do something about that. So they enslaved them. The new Pharaoh then also put an edict saying if there was any male Hebrew child born, they were to be killed. So when Moses was born, his mother put him in a basket and put him in a very conspicuous place that he would be found by Pharaoh's daughter. And we had some interesting discussion last week about that, because even though Pharaoh had made this edict that the Hebrew boys were supposed to be killed, Pharaoh's daughter still chose to adopt him as her own. Why would she do that? Well, we really don't know other than God provided that. But 
there is some discussion that it's said, there's no proof in scripture, but it's said that Pharaoh's daughter couldn't have any children of her own. And so she was wanting to have a child. And so when this baby showed up available, she said, finally, I got a child of my own. And so she adopted him. So uh, Gary, I think you were the only one that's here today that was here last week. Do you remember anything interesting about what happened to Moses after that? She found Moses in the basket. And then what happened? Took him in and then his sister, right? Mm -hmm. Moses' sister, uh, Mary, Miriam. Asked, you know, do you want me to find a, a mother to nurse the child or to, to good? And, and, and she said yes. And actually got Moses' real mother. So Moses ended up going back home. So he was found by the princess, which basically stayed him from a death sentence. So now he wasn't put to death. And then he gets to go back home. How long did he stay there? So it wasn't just until he was weaned. Scripture tells us that he was able to stay there until he was about six years old. Okay. And because of that, he got all of the Jewish teachings. He knew all of the, the training that Jewish boys are supposed to have as they're being raised in the home. He had all the bedtime stories. He had all of the lessons that were necessary. But what was the, the importance of being six before Pharaoh's daughter came and collected him? No, we're past that point already. So now it's school age. It's time for him to go to school. And so she picked him up to put him into the Egyptian school systems. So that's what we need to talk about today. That's where we are. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> so remember all of these lessons that we're going through. It's I'm planning eight weeks. It may be 12 weeks, depending on where, where we're at. So last week we talked about protection and providence of God. Yes, sir. <laughs> but hey, I hurt myself, but I'm still here. Okay, I didn't intentionally hurt myself. then uh, today we're going to be talking about Moses himself. So Moses' passion and Moses' personality. So this is now Exodus chapter 2. We're moving into verse 11. This is uh, 11 through 15, and it's too small for me. So can somebody read that for us? Many years later, when Moses was growing up, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to the one who had started the fight. The man replied, Who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid, thinking, everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened, and he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. All right, so I could preach just a week just on this. <laughs> there is so much in here. Um, so let me ask you. Yes. So Moses knew he was going to kill him, and so he was looking around to make sure everybody saw him kill him. Premeditated murder. Really? Yeah. Okay. I never heard that part. Of yeah, that. it was. So that's that's one thing. First of all, many years later, we don't know if we're reading in order. We don't know exactly how many years later. It's not until later in Moses's life that we can backtrack and we can tell, oh, he was 40. Okay. Was 40. So okay. we know we left off at, at six right. when... Pharaoh's daughter then takes him to go live in the palace to be trained. So now this is 34 years later. We don't know what happened oh. in there except for all of the training. I'm going to talk more specifically about that in just a little bit. So he's grown up. Yeah, he's 40. Okay. 
So it says that he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews. This is new for him. This word here basically is saying he knows that he's Jewish. He's 40. Even though he was raised Egyptian, he knows that he's Jewish. And so he goes to just see, I wonder what my people are doing. Well, we see that in this, in this verse right here, because he goes out there and he sees now that they're not just servants. He sees that this is forced labor. He sees how hard that they're working. Okay. And at this point, then he sees an Egyptian that is beating one of his fellow Hebrews. Now, this word here for beating is not just a whip on the back. He's going to beat him to death. Okay. Yeah, this is, this is something that's not going to be survivable if Moses doesn't intervene. So in Moses's defense at this point, he's actually preventing a murder of uh, a, a relative, maybe, you know, somebody that, that is his kindred. But before he starts beating up this Egyptian, he's looking around to see if there's anybody else that's going to see him beating this Egyptian. Well, he beats the Egyptian so hard that, oh, he's dead. And so then he buries him in the sand, which is ludicrous. Buries him in the sand? Yeah. And so basically nobody's watching. So I'm just going to move some of the sand away and dump them in there and just cover them up. Yeah. So it's not much of a hiding place. Right. So that's kind of funny right there. And then he thinks he's gotten away with it. Moses goes out to look at his people again the next day. And he sees two Hebrews fighting. At this point, he's saying, wait a minute. I, I just put my life and reputation on the line protecting you and now you're beating each other what, what what is this shouldn't you love each other i mean i showed my love for you that's what that's what he's going on here and then the one hebrew says oh, so who appointed you to be our prince and judge y'all it's common knowledge that he's the prince and judge of egypt but they recognized him as being a Hebrew that's getting special treatment in the palace. Wow. That's why this is phrased like it is. So it wasn't like, oh, you look Hebrew. They knew. They've known this story for 40 years. There was a Hebrew boy that was rescued and he was taken into the princess's household. This is him. And now he thinks that he can lord himself over us. That's the statement that he's making here. OK, so this is deeper. It's a lot deeper than what we get just from who Moses killed somebody. And now he's on the run, yeah. which is usually how we hear the story. There's a lot more to it in here. So Moses knows, hey, if they know, everybody knows. And so he's like, all right, Pharaoh's going to kill me. Basically, we find out he doesn't like him anyway. So. I'm going to get out of Dodge. So he goes to Midian. So here we start in the first verses of chapter two. We learned, or before, like last week, we learned of Moses's timely birth. Remember, this was planned by God. The time was right for Moses to come along here. We also made note of God's providence and God's protection in the midst of difficult times. And now as we continue, we see Moses's passion, and we see his personality. So what kind of man would Moses turn out to be? We see actually a glimpse into it in these few verses. He cares deeply for his people. Enough that he's willing to risk his life for them. So in this first act, we see that happening already. Okay, yeah, did you like that? That's hilarious. In his early years, he was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians. We know this, and it does say all. Okay, in Acts chapter 7, we're given insight to what took place during these formative years. 
So in Acts 7, verses 21 and 22, it says, when they had to abandon him, that's Moses' family, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and raised him as her own son. So this means that he's going to have all of the rights and all of the privileges of a royal born male. Okay. Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was powerful in both speech and action. Now, some of y'all who are familiar with Bible stories, does that last sentence surprise you? Yes. Why? Because he said he was he was he wasn't good at speaking. And when he's talking, is that really what it said? No, but you know what I mean. Yeah. So we're kind of given this impression in our young Bible studies that Moses was shy or that he was he was not good at speaking or maybe he had a speech impediment or something. And that's how I've heard it taught for like 30 years. OK, but this statement here in Acts tells us otherwise that he was powerful in both speech and action. So what this means is this Charlton Heston portrayal. Did you watch it this week, Sabay? <sighs> okay. <laughs> so this Charlton Heston portrayal of Moses actually is pretty accurate in Moses's personality and in Moses's ability to turn a phrase. He was a great public speaker, which is why when Jesse was teaching on Moses, and I think probably Steve Winton before him, he was saying that the phrase that Moses was slow of speech had less to do with Moses' ability to speak and more to do with his familiarity with the Hebrew language because he didn't speak it since he was six. Okay. And so he wasn't good at Hebrew. That's why he had his brother Aaron become the mouthpiece of God. Okay. All right. Any questions on this? All right. Cool. So the time for Moses to make a choice had come. Would Moses choose to identify with the people of the world, the Egyptians, or would he identify with the people of God, the Israelites? This opportunity is ever present before us as well. We have to make a choice. To whom shall we live? Which direction will we choose? The path to the right or the road to the left? Okay. We have to make these kind of choices every day. Are we going to do what is right in God's eyes or what's right according to law, tradition, whatever is socially acceptable at this point? And I don't know if it's just because I'm looking for it more or what, but I am seeing more and more conservatives on social media taking a stand. I think we've been pushed far enough and people are starting to get vocal about it now. And it's like, it's about time. So I was doing it when we were in, in Maine and, and Massachusetts, see all the rainbow flags and, and out loud, I'm like, look, they believe in God's promise too. So yeah, I was. We're going to get that. <laughs> yeah. We are. Are. <laughs> All right. So let's let's take a moment to talk about Moses's training. Now this is important. I'm taking a little bit of detour from the the resources that I'm using to put this together for you. Because I think this is important to talk about for later on when we see the kinds of things that Moses starts doing for his people. So at this point, Moses was a grown man, right? It said many years later when Moses had grown up. According to Jewish tradition, when does a child become an adult? 13. 13. But when are they allowed to start teaching? 30. 30. So at the age of 30, 
an Israelite is considered mature enough to start imparting wisdom on others. In the land of Egypt, it's a little bit different. It's 40. Okay. So it's no coincidence that God waited until Moses was 40 for all of these events that basically unwinds all of his Egyptianness and forces him back into the Israelites. So Moses has grown. He went out to visit his people, the Hebrews. Again, we're talking Hebrews. Why? They're slaves. And he saw how hard they were forced to work. This is true slave labor. And then during this, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. That's not a word for our benefit, just because in case you forgot, Moses is Hebrew too. This is showing Moses' feelings about the Hebrew people. He identifies with them, even though for the past 34-ish years, he's been raised posh with all of the trappings that royal life includes. He still identifies with the Israelites. Okay, that's really important. Acts 7.23, we see this when Luke writes it down. One day when Moses was 40 years old. Ah, so we see it here in Acts. He decided to visit his relatives is the way it gets translated in Acts. The people of Israel. So this is another way of showing that, hey, these aren't just friends that I share some some. Uh, common experiences with before I was six. No, he considers these people his kin. These are his kindred, okay? So it's deeper the way that Moses is thinking about these people, okay? It says Moses was mighty in words and deed. We see in Acts 7.22, Moses was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Y'all, that's important. Words are not just thrown around in scripture. If it says all, guess what? It means all. He was taught all the wisdom of the Egyptians. And this word taught doesn't mean he was exposed to it. He also proved that he knew it. This guy was wicked smart. Okay. He knew it all. He was powerful in both speech and in action. Moses was taught carefully as one who was part of the royal family. Basically, he was being prepared to take the throne if the need arose. That's how his education was done for him. Sive, is that a question? Exactly. And that's who I'm pulling on next. Thank you for that segue. All right. So he would have been properly equipped to serve in the highest offices of the country. So basically, if you're going to manage somebody, you need to know how to do their job. Well, that's not how a lot of managers are, are put together today. Um, I was going to talk about public school systems, but I won't. Thank you. So Egyptian culture and education were preserved and controlled chiefly by the priests. A powerful intellectual elite in the Egyptian theocracy who also served as the political bulwarks by preventing cultural diversity. Oh. The humanities, as well as such practical subjects as science, medicine, mathematics, and geometry, were in the hands of the priests who taught in the formal schools. Vocational skills related to such fields as architecture, engineering, and sculpture were generally transmitted outside the context of formal schooling. So in Germany, when we were there in 2000, we looked very deeply at the education system there. And their school starts at 9 a.m. and it's finished at 2. 
Okay, that's every day. And after two o'clock, they don't just to get to go home and go play. At two o'clock, that's when they have to go to a place where they're apprenticing. So they have their formal schooling that's done, reading, writing, arithmetic, but then at two o'clock, they have to go and pursue whatever it is that they're going to do for a job. And they, they, they choose that early, like sixth grade. Yeah, so they have a battery of aptitude tests that happen in primary school. And so during the first few years of primary school, these kids are already tracked into a vocation. Mm -hmm. They're either going to be going into a trade and that's put together very early, or they're gonna go into an office setting, mm -hmm. or they're gonna be promoted to higher education. So those three tracks are put together before second grade. They don't get to. So what happens is throughout their education, they have additional aptitude batteries, more tests that they have to do. And if it shows that their IQ or personality or aptitude changes, then they get retracted. Okay. But it's done for them. It's, it's not like, oh my God, you have to take the star test. If you don't pass it, da, da, da. it's not like that. No. I mean, if, if, if you're on a university track and in junior high you take a test, then it becomes obvious, yeah, this one's not <laughs> gonna make university, then they retract them into a vocational track, okay? But it's tracked early on. So that's the same kind of idea that's going on here in ancient Egypt. They get their, their reading, writing, and arithmetic in the priest's training, but then they have to go learn things for the vocation. The problem is that if you are in the royal family, guess which vocation you have to be trained in? All of them. Okay. So Moses was busy. All right. So Egyptians developed two types of formal schools for privileged youth under the supervision of governmental officials and priests, one for scribes and the other for priest trainees. At the age of five, pupils entered the writing school and they continued their studies in reading and writing until the age of 16 or 17. At the age of 13 or 14, the schoolboys were also given practical training in offices for which they were being prepared. Priesthood training began at the Temple College which boys entered at the age of 17. The lengths of training, depending upon the requirements for various priestly offices, depended. It's not clear whether or not the practical sciences can constituted a part of the systematically organized curriculum of the Temple College. But we do know that Moses, being basically second in command, he would have had both the religious training and the science training. He would have had both of those things. Okay. No, yeah, we do know this happened early on. The Egyptians, one of the good things about the Egyptians is that they wrote everything down. And we just had to learn the hieroglyphics in order to understand what it was that they were writing down. And the fact that they carved everything in stone yeah, makes it a little easier to, to see what the things were that they were doing. And they relied so much on the priesthood slash deity of their king, pharaohs. Everything was labeled as to which dynasty it was developed. And so we know which king was on the throne when these things were done. Okay, so there's really good record of the Egyptian history. So rigid method and severe discipline were applied to achieve uniformity in cultural transmission, since deviation from the traditional pattern of thought was strictly prohibited. So everybody was forced to be right thinkers. There was no independent thought. Okay, if you are independently thinking about something, you were corrected severely. Everybody was forced to fit into the mold that was established 
by the priesthood. Drill and memorization were the typical methods employed, but as noted, Egyptians also used a work study method in the final phase of training. So Egyptian education, these are the things that Moses would have been forced to excel at. Now, this may be part of that thing that Moses' parents recognized at a very young age. Why was he different from everybody else? Maybe he showed that this kid's way above his age level for what he's learning. So he may have actually showed that he was super intelligent. Mathematics, astronomy, geometry, trigonometry, engineering, reading, writing, languages. I have to ask, how come no calculus here? Was it not smart enough? It wasn't invented, it wasn't invented yet, thank you. Those first five were all bad anyway. I know, it. I had to start with the good stuff, right? So reading. You wouldn't learn a language of a slave. And that was just the arrogance coming out there. He would learn all of the languages of trade, all of the languages that were necessary for commerce. So that's what he would be. Yeah. No, you don't care what slaves say. You beat them until they comply. Yeah. Yeah, no, this, this kind of slavery, this, this is not... Slavery like we see in first century Jerusalem that we see in Jesus's time, that slavery was, I'm a servant until I pay off a debt. Oh. This slavery was, you make them comply. If they don't, you kill them and get another one. Okay. That's how this was treated. Geography, music, sports, manners, medicine, moral instruction, accounting, warfare. Okay, he would have been an expert in all of these fields. Because in my experience, people who are good in mathematics and stuff don't really do sports. You know what I mean? I'll agree with that. Thank you. I'm pretty good. At yeah, that. but also at the same time, they did not have football, baseball, hockey. I mean, they had different different sports that they did, probably involving the killing of slaves. I don't know. I don't know. So <laughs> Moses wouldn't have been just exposed to these things. He would have been an expert in these things. Okay. All right. Now Moses' conflict, and really that's loaded in itself because his conflict we can see first is an internal conflict and then it becomes an external conflict. Okay. So God, was that time to what? So Moses was loyal to his people. So he overcame that first internal conflict. Should I follow the rules that were set to me in my rearing and my education? Or do I need to help these people that really I feel a strong affinity for? Okay, that was his internal conflict. So it tells us in Hebrews 11.24, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Aren't you in the royal line? I don't care about that. I'm not affi affiliated with that. I don't want to have any part of that. So he cut those ties. They weren't cut for him. Okay. His actions showed his concern in going out to look on the burdens endured by his people. That wasn't part of his duties, okay? Usually somebody of the royal line wouldn't dirty themselves to be caught in the same vicinity as the slaves. But he went out there because he felt burdened to go out there and see how his people were being treated. Moses was loyal to God. In Hebrews eleven twenty five, 25, it says, he chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. So this is an interesting way to phrase this. So Moses wasn't just making a social choice. Am I going to be socially affiliated with the Egyptians or socially affiliated with the Jews or comfort? Am I going to be comfortable in the case of my being part of the royal family 
or am I going to be, you know, possibly turned into a slave myself? It wasn't even that choice. He saw the lifestyle of Egypt as being sin. That's what he was turning away from. He refused to enjoy the pleasures of sin. In Hebrews 11, 26, it says, he thought it was better to suffer for the sake of the Messiah than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. Now, I took this scripture from the NLT, and in the NLT, it actually says the, the sake of the Christ. But I changed the word to Messiah here because usually when we hear the word Christ, we immediately think Jesus. Yes. But now this is Old Testament. They don't know what the Messiah's name is going to be yet. Okay. So being Old Testament, they do know of the promise of the coming of a Messiah. They do know the promise of the coming of one who will restore the kingdom of God. But they didn't know his name. So I wanted to take you one step further away from thinking Jesus. He knew about Jesus? No. Yeah, yeah, true. But that's not where we are. So I didn't want you to go there. Okay. And he refused the treasures of Egypt. Now, Hebrews eleven twenty seven says it was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. This is kind of cool because the way that we read it in Exodus, he kills the guy, he buries the guy, he thinks he's going to get found out, and he says, ooh, I need to go to Midian. I need to get out of here. And it makes it sound like he's running away from the king. But we get some insight here, Hebrews eleven twenty seven, that he wasn't fearing the king's anger. So what would be the motivation? Or he didn't want to die. You're on the right track. So it's not it's not not wanting to die. It's that he knows he has a greater purpose. And he knows that if he was killed, then he wouldn't be able to fulfill that greater purpose. So this is before so he goes to Midian and mm -hmm. he doesn't come back to Egypt until he's 40. No, no he was 40, 40 here, left. and then he goes to Midian for okay. another 40 years. He doesn't come back to Egypt until he's 80. Yeah. Know, yeah. So it has to do with generations. Yes. Yeah. So he kept right on going because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. So he's just following the will of God. So by leaving, I know it, that is cool. I didn't catch that. He's keeping his eyes on the one who's invisible. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. So you get the gold star today. All right. I'll let you do it to yourself. All right. And the third point here is that he refused to compromise to the world. Okay. So it wasn't a middle ground. Maybe I could do a little of this and a little of that. No, he was he was all That's in. A huge it is. I mean, yeah, it's it's a huge days. choice that yeah. he's going to have to make. Um, my next sermon that I get to preach is actually talking about the word scission. Scission. Yeah, because we can have a decision. Yeah. You can make an incision. There's an excision. We have all of these scissions. Is there a recision? And there's yeah. recision. Indecision. Yeah. So we're going to talk about scission. I don't want to be on scission. <laughs> <laughs> so Exodus 2.15. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what happened. And he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh. See, it's that word fled. It makes it sound like fear. And he went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down beside a well. And that's where I'm going to stop the scripture right there because that's where we pick up next time. Okay. He does. It's got to be. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be. So is this the same Pharaoh that when he comes back, 
It's the same pharaoh, but 40 years later? I don't recall. I think not. But actually, I got to admit that I'm drawing more on the Ten Commandments movie. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> that's so accurate. It's all the influences. It is. It is. Oh, so I'll have, to, I'll have to do a little bit of research in the timeline. Because, well, because the pharaoh, when he comes back, has a, a young son. Or yeah. I think, son. I think it's Ramses the first and Ramses the second. Okay. But I'll have that's, to... That's Okay. 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 Yeah, they look the same. The makeup's so the same. And they believe they've been quote as step brothers. Yeah. <coughs> yes, that's and, and a yeah, an adopted brother. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's well, because he would have known him going up. Oh yeah, he would have been trained, had the same training. Uh -huh. They would know how each other thinks. Yeah, that's important. That's important for later. Yeah. yeah. That's important for later. All right. Moses' character. So Exodus 2, verses 11 and 12, we know that he hid the body in the sand. We know all of these events that he, that he did, and it was his passion that caused him to do these things, okay? He saw an Egyptian mistreating the Israelite, and so Moses came to the man's defense and avenged him, killing that Egyptian. So now it's 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 different than murder. Still murder. I'm conflicted about this, you know. But you're, it's it's murder in defense of someone. Okay. So it's not cold blooded murder. It's now a crime of passion. Okay. That's how it would be called today: a crime of passion. Then in verse 13, it says the next day when Moses went out to visit the people again, he saw two Hebrews fighting. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said, and that's interesting that he chose friend here instead of relative. Well, Moses thinks of all of these as being his relatives. But um, the fact that he's beating up somebody else, you're at least supposed to be friends, right? Yeah. Okay, so the words are important. So Moses said to the one who had started the fight, the man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Who did? Right. Pharaoh. Well, Pharaoh's daughter, right. by extension, Pharaoh, but ultimately, God. Okay. Are you going to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Yikes. Acts 7. Day. Yeah. So... The next day, this is from Acts now, so slightly different. The next day he visited them again and saw two men of Israel fighting. He tried to be a peace, he tried to be a peacemaker. Men, he said, you are brothers. So now here we've got the relative idea. Why are you fighting each other? But the man in the wrong pushed Moses aside. Hmm. So that's that's a little different. Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? He asked. Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? When Moses heard that, he fled the country and he lived as a foreigner in the land of Midian. So more on this next time. There, his two sons were born. All right. Midian, Midianites. Yep, Midianites. That's it. All right. So in these verses we learn that Moses's early training that with his family mm -hmm. stuck with him he identified with the Hebrews his character trumped his orders his wisdom trumped his station we learn that he flees to begin a new life in Midian and he starts this new life by sitting down by a well okay He's 40, a middle-aged adult. He should be settling into his station in life. But instead, he now gets to begin his desert training. Okay? Totally different. He's 40, middle-aged then? No, they, at this point, they would live to be 100. Mm -hmm. So, so early middle age. Okay? Off alone in the wilderness, Moses eventually would encounter God. Seeing a strange sight, 
which causes Moses to take a detour. What is the strange sight? Yeah, the burning bush. But right now, he has made a decision that by all accounts was foolish. He had all of the privileges of royalty. He had all of the wealth, power, everything, and he turns it all away and decides to be part of slavery, to be counted amongst those who are slaves, okay? This is a very foolish decision in the eyes of the world, but God has a bigger plan, and Moses sees that. He knows that he can't stay in what he was doing. Yeah, that's not part of his science training, so he had to go check it out. Yeah. Justice Antonin Scalia, 1936 to 2016, believing in traditional Christianity is something else, Scalia said. Referencing beliefs such as God being born, the son of a virgin, and the concept of heaven and hell, God assumed from the beginning that the wise of the world would view Christians as fools. And he has not been disappointed. Yeah. Okay. That's awesome. So memory verse for this week, don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. That's Philippians 2, 4. All right, so just after 10. So any questions about anything that we went over today? I missed the beginning part. Uh -huh. Moses wasn't in the basket at six years old. And got... Yeah, that was all last week, which is why all week long I said, have you read my lesson yet? Yeah, well, I was sick. <laughs> so, he was in the basket. so three months old, she put him in the basket. Okay. Okay, and then... Pharaoh's daughter found him intentionally placed there. And then Miriam was waiting for her to come by. When she came by, Miriam then runs up to her and says, oh, you found a baby. Would you like me to find somebody to nurse him for you? Yes, okay, that's where I'll make sure. Okay, and so then Moses goes back home with his family. So mom, dad, Miriam, Aaron, and now Moses, family of five, growing up as a normal okay. Israelite child until it was time for school age. Cool. So like five or six years old. Okay. At that point, then it's time to start his formal training. So Pharaoh's daughter then sends someone. The Ten Commandments shows her driving up to the house driving up in a chariot. Okay. Yeah. So she comes to the house herself. No, that's not going to happen. Girls his age would be such yeah. an older boy because all older boys have been yeah <laughs> yeah there would have been no yeah no boys his age to play with yeah and you know think about this the best slave labor labor is male labor and so the Pharaoh is actually reducing They're the workers. The yeah. <laughs> He's decimating the workforce of the future. Right. The main fear, remember what the main fear was, <laughs> that, the, that yeah. the Israelite men would create their own army yeah. and overthrow right. Egypt. So his, his goal was to get rid of soldiers. Potential soldiers. soldiers, yeah, potential soldiers. It's like what the, the going back in time and killing Hitler before he just killed us. And and just they use women for more than just queen. That he wouldn't get rid of his playthings. So, well, remember this is a different way of thinking. They were wanting to create more Israelites. And nationality comes through the father. Right. 
so Egyptian dads, Israelite Hebrew women, produce Egyptian heirs. Yeah, different way of thinking. No. Really? They probably wouldn't have allowed him to. I figured they would have married him to another Egyptian woman. I mean, another royalty woman. You would think, but what did I just say? I don't know. The lineage is passed down through the father. So they would let him. Everybody in that world has a Right. Because they knew that there was going to be a son. Right. Right. I think the whole nation knew. You know, looking at the way that the, the Hebrews called him out. Well, because he spent his first six years with his Hebrew family. Yeah. This is the boy who lived. <laughs> yeah, we went. We were at a funeral yesterday and some of my former students are in, in the pews. Oh, hi, Mr. Scott. I'm like, hello. Hi, how are you doing? Familiar, but not. Yeah. Yeah, and that's not 30 years later. Yeah. Good stuff. Anything else? It's really hard. I mean, he had all the, the treasures. Yeah. Of the worldly ways of the, the women and the treasures and the money and the, the you know the but, servants and he chose the way of but God. he was that's discontent. A, that's a very uh, that's mm. discipline. Yeah. Discontent. He had learned enough to at the age five to hear the story exactly. of Messiah and what was coming that at some point in his that going back to back his family. Raise a child and the way he should go when he's old. So most of what we know come from the prophets, right? We would actually have to look at a chronological Bible and find out in a timeline if there was any other of the prophets, because we know Enoch already would have been talking about repentance and coming back to the kingdom of God. And that's prior to the flood. That Noah's grandfather, grandfather. great grandfather, Methuselah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So <laughs> Methuselah, Methuselah was Noah's grandfather. Enoch. Enoch was Mos was Methuselah's father. Oh, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Moses. Oh yeah. No, Noah. Uh, Noah. Thank you. Say again. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. Methuselah died in the flood. No. So that's a really important story. So Enoch was was basically a prophet telling everybody, you need to repent because God's going to judge the world. Okay. And then when Enoch had a child, he named the child Methuselah, which means after I die, it will come. So every time somebody says, here comes Methuselah, his crazy dad named him the world's going to end after I die. So let's not kill him, you know? So it's just kind of a, it's just kind of a weird thing. So then Methuselah dies of natural causes at the age of 969. He just expires. And it wasn't two years later than the flood. Yeah. Cause he doesn't really come from this little black line right here. But he's not, he lives 900, no, 969 years, and then Jared lived 962. You don't hear much about Jared. No, second second people, they don't get fed it. Second sons, or yeah, no, exactly. Christmas Day in the middle. Yeah, yes. and while yes. Enoch was still preaching repentance. Yes, that's why I love that so much. Because you see the crossover, which you don't think mm -hmm. happens until. Yeah. So my question with <coughs> Moses learning all these languages was that at the same time where he would be, you said the, um, the, the trade routes and stuff, so he would have known 